Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I realize nobody has any plans for 4.30 on a Friday afternoon. You didn't have anything else you wanted to do than to come to CSIS, so I'm glad that we could help out. No, I'm seriously, I'm very flattered and honored that you would come, and I would like to think it was us, but I really know it's our speaker, and we're very honored and pleased that the defense minister is joining us today. Uh, thank, we thank him for making a part of his program while he's in Washington to speak to the policy community in Washington. And it's a great privilege to be able to welcome Minister of Defense Onodera. Uh, I've had the privilege of meeting him on a number of occasions, and he's, uh, he's exactly the right man at the right time. Uh, these are challenging days in Japan. These are hard days in Japan, and these are a challenging environment. Uh, and the minister is, I think, he, exceptional in his, his calm assurance. He reassures uh, the American people, as he does the Japanese citizens, that there's a solid, wise, thoughtful judgment that's informing his leadership of the ministry. It, this is an important thing, and we're all very lucky to have a man of his character and his background and his experience as the Minister of Defense in Japan these days. Now, he's, uh, his second home is Washington. He was a student and a fellow here in Washington, just up the street at uh, the School of International Studies, Johns Hopkins. Now, I, had, I want to point that out. At least there are two graduates, one who did well of SAIS, and, and so I'm very happy to welcome him and to, to celebrate the fact that we went to the same school together. Uh, my job here today is not to, uh, to formally, you know, read a bi biography, but I want to give you an insight into his character, because I think that's the most important thing. And it wasn't until just in preparation for this that I came to learn that uh, Minister Odadera has a personal motto that he's used throughout his professional life. And that motto is Ichigu wo Terusu, which means light up a corner of the world. I think that's remarkable, and I think it's an insight into his character. His character in public leadership is to bring insight and calm reflection to help all of us create a better world. And I think that's exactly what we want to have in a defense minister. So could I ask you with your applause to please welcome and thank the presence of Minister Onodero, who is with us this afternoon. <laughs> President Hamry, Senior Vice President Green, thank you so much for this invitation today. I see there's a brand new building here, and this shows how much CSIS is making. Once again, I feel this. There were a lot of students at SAIS, but I was the only one that uh, was uh, this poor in English, so. Now, with, direct, with President Hamre, uh, he came to see me in Tokyo in January at the Ministry of Defense. And he, he told me that a speech at CSIS would be more important than having a meeting with Secretary Hegel. Actually, I just had a meeting with um, Secretary Hegel become, before coming here. And uh, I uh, relayed uh, what um, Mr. Hamry had uh, said. And I'm uh, very pleased that I'm able to uh, fulfill the promise uh, I made to uh, Mr. Hamry and uh, to cap off a, a week-long visit to the US with this most important event. I went to Dallas and Omaha after San Diego and then Washington, DC. I saw various US military installations and I was able to see uh, some very important um, uh, places. Also, um, President Hamry invited uh, Prime Minister Abe to CSIS last year. 
And in his speech, uh, he strongly declared that Japan was back. About a year and a half has passed since that. And not only is Japan back, but under Prime Minister Abe's leadership, we have made great progress in our security policy. In the Asia-Pacific region, what challenges does Japan face? How does Japan intend on fulfilling its responsibilities? That will be the topic of my speech. For more than 70 years, we have consistently pr protected an order that has provided peace and prosperity, but it's facing serious challenges now. The nations of the Asia-Pacific region are connected by a great ocean. Since time immemorial, we have used the sea for exchanges and to develop. Now, the Asia-Pacific region is at the center of the world economy. It accounts for roughly 40% of world trade and constitutes a huge trading bloc. The Asian middle class is expected to add a billion members in the next 10 years. The importance of the stability of, of the Asia-Pacific region to the U.S. economy goes without saying as well. Today, I would like to seek your heightened awareness on this point. The U.S. stands with the Asia-Pacific, and the Asia-Pacific has no future without American participation. Japan and the U.S. must never forget this. In April of 1996, uh, then Prime Minister Hashimoto and President Clinton said that uh, they were uh, preparing the U.S.-Japan alliance for a new uh, stage in the 21st century and issued a joint declaration on security. The declaration began by saying that our strong bilateral ties had contributed to the peace and the stability of the region, and that they also um, supported the dynamic economic growth of the region. Creating a peaceful and prosperous Asia Pacific is a clear common objective of Japan and the United States. For the peace and prosperity of the region, including during the Cold War, Japan and the United States have supported a free and open maritime order, even at times risking lives, also based on the rule of law. However, recently there have been attempts to unilaterally change this order. The incursions into the territorial waters surrounding the Senkaku Islands, which are inherent Japanese territory, or targeting fire control radar on a self-defense ship engaged in patrol and surveillance, unilateral designation of an air defense identification zone, abnormal approaches by warplanes. At the front lines, the self-defense force daily confronts uh, such a provocative behavior and has uh, carried out it, uh, its duties with restraint and firmness. Well, the front lines of Japan, Japan's defense are an expansive ocean, the skies above it, and roughly 6,800 islands. Since taking office, I have visited facilities of the self-defense forces on 13 remote islands where self-defense members are 24 hours a day uh, conducting surveillance. And I have uh, encouraged individual 
self-defense force members. One must defend one's own territory by one's own hands. This isn't unique to Japan. Along with encouraging our own units, I have gone to areas around the South China Sea, from Cameron Bay in Vietnam to the west, Subic Bay in the Philippines to the east, up to Guam, islands on the so-called first and second island chains, and met with uh, Defense Secretary Guzman of the Philippines, uh, General Tan of uh, the Vietnam, and uh, Hishamuddin of Malaysia, uh, Defense Minister exchanged views with them, and they agree. One must defend one's own territory by one's own hand. But in this age, in defense, countries cannot stand alone. These countries now want stronger ties with Japan and the United States. Prime Minister Abe, as on his first overseas trip, went to of Vietnam. And before his first year in office was out, he visited all 10 ASEAN member states. I have visited six ASEAN member states and taken advantage of the Shangri-La Dialogue and the ADMM Plus to have meetings with all of the defense ministers of ASEAN member states. Also, uh, thanks to a Japanese initiative, the first Japan ASEAN Defense Ministerial Roundtable is to be held this year. In this manner, Japan has uh, steadily worked to advance its ties with uh, ASEAN member states. The U.S. has also worked on uh, deepening its relations with ASEAN. And last uh, uh, June uh, last year, I visited Subic Bay in the Philippines, and I saw US P-3C flying toward the South China Sea into the uh, clear blue sky. And I felt, as one only can on the ground, the importance of the US military presence. Rotational deployments of littoral combat ships to Singapore, and the uh, agreement signed in April between the U.S. and the Philippines, deepening defense ties, I hope will uh, lead Asia to greater stability. Now, since the Abe government uh, was formed, we have seen uh, a marked increase in the number of members of the U.S. Congress visiting the Japanese member street, Ministry of Defense. I myself have already met with uh, upwards of 30 uh, members, mostly from the Armed Services and Foreign Relations uh, House and Senate Committees. And uh, I've seen uh, others from the U.S., uh, such as um, President Hamry of CSIS and others who have experience in senior posts at state and defense. Now, these uh, experts and these members, why did they all come to see me? It's because I think that they all had a certain doubt. What is this defense minister aiming for? Is he trying to start something with China? Is he trying to get the U.S. dragged into that fight? I think that's what was on their mind. One former Secretary of State made me feel as if I were undergoing an oral examination at university by firing a lot of tough questions across the table. But after my response, that former Secretary of State invited me to Stanford to give a speech, which must mean that um, my explanation was understood. Now, on that occasion and on others when I had uh, visitors from the U.S., uh, this is what I said. I am not seeking confrontation with China. We wish to lead uh, China to becoming uh, a country that is responsible and that contributes to the peace and prosperity of the Asia-Pacific region. Japan wishes to uh, prevent and avoid unintended situations and is energetically reaching out to China for that. 
we are reaching out to them to try to make a Japan-China hotline operational, a, a maritime uh, contact mechanism. When uh, Prime Minister Abe was in government, the first time with then Premier Wen Jiaobao, they almost got to the operational stage. But after that, there was a change in administrations, and we haven't seen much progress. But Prime Minister Abe continues to believe that such mechanisms will uh, contribute to the uh, peace and stability of the region. We will continue to reach out to China on this matter. The U.S. has also reached out to China in various forms. The U.S. Navy is hosting a multilateral exercise called RIMPAC, and now China is participating for the first time, thanks to a U.S. Inv invitation. We very much uh, hope that uh, the Chinese Navy will learn uh, seamanship through this exercise, and we welcome their participation. Our door is always open to dialogue, but on the other hand, if against the background of force, there are unilateral, uh, there's unilateral behavior that disrupts the order, we must respond firmly, and we must not forget this either. Japan, also the U.S., and China, which are included in the Asia-Pacific region, and the international community as a whole for its peace and uh, prosperity, we must not tolerate unilateral uh, changes in the status quo um, through force. Now, by coming to this uh, uh, speech today, I uh, said at the outset that I'm fulfilling a pro promise to uh, Mr. Hamry. It's sometimes said that uh, once Japanese people um, promise, once they make up their minds, then they follow through. They do get things done. North Korea has continued uh, provocative uh, statements and behavior, including suggesting uh, missile launches and nuclear tests. Last year, they mentioned not just Japanese cities, but Hawaii, Guam, and the Washington, D.C. as being within the range of its ballistic missiles. This was the North Korean threat. North Korea has steadily continued its development of ballistic missiles that can reach the U.S. mainland. Based on this situation, in uh, February of uh, last year, uh, Prime Minister Abe agreed, along with uh, President Obama, to add a second uh, installation of a Tipi-2 radar in Japan. And uh, following that, uh, we were able to uh, put things on track for creating a, a site in Kyoto where there had been no previous uh, U.S. base, and uh, the construction has already started, and it's, intent it's expected to be operational on schedule. So Japanese people um, getting things done once they decide, a great example of that is the BMD system. When uh, Secretary General of the Liberal, Liberal Democratic Party, Shigeru Ishiba, was uh, Director General of Defense, uh, the Japanese government decided to build a BMD system. Ten years have passed, and now we have 17 Patriot units. We have four radars cap capable of detecting ballistic missiles, s seven radars capable of tracking BM uh, ballistic missiles, four uh, BMD-equipped Aegis ships. We have a 24-hour seamless uh, system that protects the people of Japan as well as U.S. bases in Japan. When you add the TPY-2 to this, Japan has a world-class ballistic missile uh, defense uh, system. And we intend to increase our uh, the number of Aegis ships by four and to uh, continue to make progress in terms of uh, ballistic uh, missile defense. Japanese people will get things done once they decide to do it. Japan will continue to be an ally that the U.S. can count on. The uh, North Koreans are engaged with us on talks regarding abductions. 
But this does not mean at all that we take lightly the questions of missiles and of uh, nuclear development. We uh, intend to continue our close uh, coordination with the U.S. and the ROK, especially with the um, Defense Minister of uh, the ROK. Uh, at any time, I am prepared to have a, a bilateral defense uh, minister's meeting. The U.S. Uh, now has a policy that gives importance to the Asia-Pacific region. It's called uh, rebalancing, and we very much welcome it. At the 2 plus 2 in Tokyo last year, there was a joint statement, and the TPY-2, the P-8 uh, uh, patrol uh, craft, and Global Hawk, uh, cutting-edge uh, equipment is being uh, deployed to Japan. In April, in a meeting with uh, Secretary Hagel, there was a plan that was announced to uh, deploy two more uh, Egypt ships to Japan. We uh, very much welcome the re rebalancing uh, strat strategy and will uh, give our full cooperation to it. In order to achieve a stable deployment of uh, the U.S. forces in uh, Japan, it's important to reduce the burden on Okinawa, especially uh, replacing uh, Futenma is one of the top priorities of the Abe government. We are uh, firmly uh, committed to uh, making uh, sure that this uh, replacement happened. I've visited Okinawa seven times. And with respect to uh, moving to Guam, we are also, uh, as a government, committed to this. We have uh, spent roughly uh, $950 million of Jap Japanese taxpayers' money uh, for uh, this uh, project. And we uh, hope that uh, we will continue to move steadily on this plan. We want to have stronger uh, co cooperation with the U.S. U.S., uh, Japan, uh, Australia, U.S., Japan, India, U.S., Japan, uh, uh, ROK, in order to build a uh, more stable uh, secure, sec security environment. And Pacific Partnership 2014, uh, there were uh, transport ships that uh, had uh, U.S. and Australian forces on them and for the first time went into the South China Sea. With respect to uh, U.S., Japan, and South Korea, last year, uh, Iwasaki, uh, chairman of the, the Joint Staff Council, and uh, Dempsey, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, for the first time had a trilateral uh, Chiefs of Defense uh, conference. In the previous month, there was also a, a trilateral defense ministers meeting. As to the U.S., Japan, and India, for the first time in five years, we are planning an exercise called Manabar near Okinawa. The U.S. and Japan have great ties of trust, and we are becoming uh, something that uh, is uh, uh, a platform for further cooperation. In February, Prime Minister Abe to President Obama said that Japan will carry out responsibilities with the United States and talked about his determination on various uh, defense policies. Last year, for the first time in 11 years, we increased our defense spending. And at the end of last year, uh, in order to uh, protect our remote islands, uh, the airs and the sea, we created a new uh, defense uh, plan and strategy. The maritime and air self-defense forces will be strengthened and have um, amphibious units for the first time. Also recently, a new legislative uh, effort uh, was the uh, object of a cabinet decision, including collective self-defense. 
Prime Minister Abe has been telling uh, Prime Minister Obama about these developments for a year and a half. Let me give some details about the cabinet decision last year. On uh, July 1st, we w will we were able to have a historic cabinet decision that will change the direction in which we have uh, looked at our uh, legislative uh, structure. Not just the, uh, uh, just the country of Japan, but rather the uh, inv security environment that surrounds us, we will fundament fundamentally look, uh, revise it to look at uh, new technologies, to uh, prevent pro proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. And these threats can happen anywhere in the world and can have direct uh, effects on Japan's security. No country can continue to uh, protect peace on its own. We must increase our defensive capabilities and especially we must increase the effectiveness of the U.S.-Japan alliance and increase its deterrence. In any circumstance, the lives of the citizens of our country must be protected and based on a principle of international uh, cooperation and uh, proactive contributions to peace, we will contribute to the uh, peace and stability of the international uh, community. And we need to create uh, legislation domestically that will make f further such contributions possible. The next three points are included in this. First, up to now, Article 9 of the Constitution has been interpreted to uh, be limited to when an armed attack happened uh, in areas surrounding Japan. But now, when other countries that are have close ties to Japan have an armed attack against them, or when there is uh, threats to the life or the freedom of the uh, people of Japan, a clear danger, then we will uh, remove this danger. And when there are no other appropriate measures, then the necessary minimum uh, measures will be, uh, be able to be taken for uh, self-defense. And this was the de decision that we reached uh, in uh, looking at the Constitution. For example, if the US was attacked militarily, and there were a uh, U.S. warship near uh, Japan between uh, Guam and uh, Hawaii, or a ballistic missile that were on its way there, Japan would not have been able to uh, take any measure against it up to now. But is that acceptable? When you consider the U.S.-Japan alliance, is it not uh, is it uh, allowable for us not to uh, try to intercept such a missile that has a U.S. target? And if there's a gray zone, let's say it's neither peacetime nor wartime, we have to uh, make our uh, posture more robust to deal with this as well. Now, the U.S. Uh, units in order to protect them, the self-defense forces must be able to use a necessary and minimum uh, use of force. And this is the direction in which our legislation will move. And when the US and Japanese forces are um, moving, uh, working cooperatively, the self-defense forces will be able to respond appropriately. The third point, even if Japan does not use force, Japan, in cer certain cases, m may need to support the U.S., which might be using force. And we uh, should create legislation to make that possible as well. The government as a whole will now 
start creating this legislation, and we believe that this will uh, dramatically uh, deepen our ties with our ally, the United States. Also, the, what was agreed with Secretary Hagel, the revision of the U.S.-Japan defense guidelines will be accelerated. Once again, I was able to verify this with Secretary Hale. This is our first revision of the guidelines in 17 years. And it will deal with not just Japan's defense, but the security environment of the Asia Pacific region as a whole and allow us to respond to that environment. And the revision work should be done by the end of the year and should contribute to strengthening the US Japan alliance. I have one more point to add. In April, Japan uh, created a new policy on export of uh, weapons. Because of the difficult security environment, we want to have a stronger cooperation with other countries, including the US. International uh, cooperative development, including the F-35, and uh, repair uh, of uh, equipment uh, and other such uh, uh, matters uh, should be expanded. And we will make even clearer and more transparent the uh, rules governing uh, such activity. And we believe this will allow us to contribute even more to peace and stability. Building a peaceful and prosperous Asia Pacific we must not tolerate uh, changes in the status quo uh, via force. Our uh, defense policy is very consistent with that. In this year and a half, we've had many policies in the security uh, area that all contribute to strengthening our alliance with the United States. And trying to uh, change the status quo via force will be deterred by a stronger U.S.-Japan alliance. And also, we will be able to prevent uh, unexpected situations. And by uh, having trilateral cooperation with like-minded countries, we will be able to uh, also contribute. The most important thing is that all of these Japanese policies after the Second World War have not at all uh, moved against peace. These measures are to make us even more of a country that promotes peace. In conclusion, Prime Minister Abe at the end of uh, May, the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore for the, age, for the uh, peace and prosperity of Asia to be eternal was something that he, he wished. And he got warm applause from the room. Secretary Hegel at the same uh, dialogue gave a speech, said that uh, the US as a Pacific power would support uh, uh, freedom of na navigation and would uh, oppose uh, coercion and intimidation and threats and uh, made a very clear speech as well. At the same uh, speech, I said that we were against uh, changes uh, in the status quo through uh, force and that uh, it was important to insist on the rule of law. Prime Minister Abe, Secretary Egel, and, and myself consistently uh, gave out the same message, saying that we attached importance to the rule of law and would not tolerate changes in the status quo through force. This was a consistent theme brought out by the US and Japan at that dialogue. After that, at the G7 in Brussels, Prime Minister uh, Abe stressed that any action to alter the status quo by force should not be accepted anywhere in the world. Again, that message was strongly supported. We will build a peaceful and prosperous Asia Pacific region. This is why we will not accept the change of the status quo by force. This uh, message uh, we will continue to uh, put forth, and it's uh, very much accepted by world opinion. 
we will oppose attempts to change the status quo and um, stand with the United States in doing so. The U.S. and Japan should take leadership in this area because we're both democracies that uphold open policies. And we are two nations that recognize regional common interests and shared responsibilities. In the last year and a half, Japan is not merely back. Moreover, its uh, engagement in developing security and defense uh, policy in the region is uh, very much uh, uh, moving forward. We are uh, carrying, taking on more responsibility in the region. There's nothing unnatural about this. It's natural for a great power like Japan to play a responsible role for the region based on the significance of the area and the increasingly acute regional security environment. Japan will play a responsible role for the regional peace and prosperity with the United States and Australia, South Korea, and partners in uh, Southeast Asia and India. I cannot guarantee that such a path uh, for the peace and stability of the region will not be rocky. Rather, it may be long and difficult. Japan will continue to walk this path hand in hand with the U.S. as we have for 70 years. I'm so pleased to have had this chance to speak today. In a year and a half, uh, I have uh, met with more than uh, 30 defense ministers and uh, directly explained uh, our uh, defense policy. And today, I've been able to do so at CSIS. It's truly an honor for me. In the future, Japan's security and defense policies will continue to be explained by us with openness and transparency. And Japan, as a country promoting peace, will continue to walk this path. Thank you so much for your attention. Minister, thank you um, for um, sharing, uh, well, shedding some light uh, on our corner of the world um, this afternoon. And thank you, everyone, for coming um, on a Friday afternoon. Uh, I'm Michael Green. I'm Senior Vice President for Asia and Japan Share at CSIS. Um, we have about 20 minutes, I think, for Q&A. Um, I'm going to ask the first question, since I have the mic. When I call on you and you get a microphone, um, would you speak into the microphone, identify yourself, and please keep the question short? Um, and let me also add one last uh, point, which is you uh, do not need to take the um, translation air pieces with you. They won't work very well outside of this room, so leave them on your chair when we're finished. We'd appreciate that. <laughs> um, Minister, you, um, uh, you gave a very well-balanced and very strategic speech, and I especially appreciated the, the precise and clear description of the cabinet decision on July 1st with respect to collective self-defense, which, as you said, is so important for the alliance between our two countries for deterrence and stability. Um, uh, and we'll all be watching the legislative process, the defense guidelines review, um, which will be the next important steps to this. And I also thought it was very important that you highlighted the um, maritime communication mechanism uh, and other conference of building steps that you're ready to take with China. Um, and we're on track to conclude with China. And I think it's important um, that those also get back on track for the interests of Japan the U.S., China, and the whole region. <clears throat> you touched on third parties, um, like-minded states, U.S. allies and friends, uh, cooperation with uh, India, Korea, and Australia. Um, and I noted that you said you're ready to go to Korea as soon as the Korean defense minister uh, is um, ready to receive you. And I wanted to ask you about that. Um, Korea is a very close friend, democratic, uh, treaty ally of the United States <clears throat> with common values with Japan and similar security challenges. Um, when you do have your uh, meeting with the defense minister in Seoul uh, uh, or in Japan, wherever you do it, what's your philosophy for moving forward with Japan-Korea relations, uh, particularly with respect to security? And what kind of areas of defense cooperation would you like to emphasize, uh, if possible? 
まずあの日米韓この3 US, Japan, ROK. Not just North Korea, it's important for various issues. In various meetings, I have myself, and it, I think it might change now, but Kim g u n j i n the defense minister, many times I had、uh, s p o k e with the minister. The same message of the defense、uh, authorities is that if bilateral ties improve, Then、uh, a defense、uh, ministerial meeting will be possible and it will be easier to have defense cooperation. I myself think that、uh, Japan ROK ties are very important. I hope that、uh, quickly our relations, especially in terms of diplomacy and government to government, will improve. Thank you.、Uh, Kevin Mayer with NMB Consulting. Welcome to Washington, sir. Somewhat of a down in the weeds question, but I'll keep it short. With the change to collective self defense policy, how far would Japan be willing to go in terms of a real integrated force structure? Integrated not just bilaterally with the U.S., but between the maritime self defense forces and the air self defense forces, for example. And will this be reflected in your? Procurement of capabilities. For, as one example, your upcoming EX competition, the early warning aircraft. Will you go for things that really allow a real integration with U.S. forces like cooperative engagement capability and integrated fire control? Can you go that far now? Japan building up its uh, defensive uh, capabilities is mostly、uh, based on、uh, protecting our own territory.、Uh, we don't uh, have uh, a big role in terms of contributing、uh, all around the world like the U.S. does. As much as we can, we want to make it possible for us to cooperate with the United States. For example, we have Uh, cooperation that has to do with、uh, procurement now, and it's important to continue training as well. And to deepen it will be important. I have been、uh, talking about the changes in our defense policy, but、uh, I think some of you may have been surprised.、Uh, U.S. ships that are sent to de defend Japan. And Japan has not, let's say Japan has not yet been attacked, but that ship is attacked. The Constitution was interpreted to say that we could not help that ship. So for 70 years, we have、uh, had that outlook. Not go to the problem, but To try to、um, actually help out is what an ally should naturally do. That's how this change in policy should be understood. We also look at this from the standpoint of deterrence. It's important、uh, for the US and Japan and China that problems not happen in the first place, including all of our economies. Thank you. Stanley Roth, the Boeing Company. As a fellow SAIS graduate, I have to agree with Dr. Hamry,、uh, as always, that I'm feeling like something of an underachiever personally as well. My question is a bit sensitive one about the Japanese defense budget. And in asking it, I recognize that you could flip the question and ask me about the U.S. defense budget and whether it's adequate for American needs. But since you're the Japanese Minister of Defense, I'll ask you about Japan's budget. It,、um, Obviously, symbolically very important that there was an increase, which you mentioned in your speech. But in terms of the needs of Japan's forces and in terms of the very dramatic rise for over a decade, maybe two decades, in Chinese military spending in particular and a relative shift in balance of power,、uh, you know, what do you think are the main gaps that need to be addressed? And do you think there is the political will to bump up the Japanese budget over time to accommodate at least some of this gap? With respect to our、uh, military、uh, buildup, we、uh, have 
uh, created a national defense uh, program outlined and a midterm defense buildup plan, which have been transparently uh, announced. And we want to uh, continue to build up our defensive capability. If various countries engage in a buildup race, then you never uh, can see the goal. As I said before, no country can stand alone in terms of defending itself. So we want to have more alliances. And if the other country is not transparent, then we want to ask them why do you have that uh, equipment? So we want to seek transparency from others. And by having such exchanges to increase trust, and we think that's the most important thing. It may not be a question that directly has to do with your line of business, but it is what is needed for Japan's security. I also went to SICE, so if I can't call on a SICE person next, or people will think there's a conspiracy. You went to Berkeley, right? OK. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, Chris Nelson with the Nelson Report. Uh, yes, Berkeley, although I've given talks at SICE. Uh, thank you very much for a really comprehensive, uh, very clear uh, 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 speech. Much appreciated. Um, I'd like to ask a question that uh, may be a, a little more detailed, but I hope it's not hypothetical. Um, in this room this morning, at the really interesting second day of the, of the CSIS conference, uh, a former colleague of yours, uh, Admiral Kota Yoji, uh, got all of our attention by saying, you know, we've been so focused on uh, the disconnects on history and, and uh, the, the risk of incidents at sea and the air uh, risk that you have uh, said is still there because the Chinese won't talk to us, that we're missing what the Chinese are actually doing. And he, he said, we need to look at three islands or little rocks, really, out in the South China Sea, and he named them, saying the Chinese have already built one air base, and if, and if the U.S. and Japan don't develop a joint, he said naval strategy, but he meant comprehensive strategy, uh, to prevent the completion of those bases, when you combine them with Hainan Island, China will control the South China Sea. That's going to be it. Therefore, we have to uh, work together to stop this from happening. Um, is he speaking uh, in some ways for concerns that, that you share and, and you have some ideas about uh, joint U.S.-Japan and other cooperation to try to prevent this? Uh, and if so, could you share some of that with us? Thank you very much. Hello. You're referring, I think, to the South China Sea and problems that have happened between, uh, with uh, the Vietnam and the Philippines. Japan has, along with ASEAN, uh, held uh, various meetings and sent out a common message. ASEAN is also deeply concerned about this issue. We are also continually seeking uh, dialogue with China. We'd like to get a solution based on dialogue and the rule of law. Unfortunately, we've only seen uh, unilaterally, unilateral changes based on force. So uh, improved capability of maritime policing for ASEAN countries is important. And we can't just protect the region, but if there's a disaster in the region or a disaster at sea in the region, it will also help. And Japan would like to help in terms of increasing that uh, capability. Uh, yes, ma'am, right here. I'm Nicole Finch here for the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. You briefly mentioned um, a goal of improved technology for weapons of mass destruction, proliferation prevention. Um, do you see a future for U.S.-Japanese cooperation in research and development? Uh, Japan is the only um, country that uh, suffered an atomic attack. and thinks it's important to e eliminate uh, such uh, weapons. But uh, as a practical matter, 
There are countries that do have uh, nuclear arsenals, and uh, some of them make uh, provocative statements and are near Japan. And we have to take measures against them. The direction will probably be to eliminate weapons of mass destruction, but all the countries of the world have to, at the same time, go in the same direction. Otherwise, there won't be progress. So more international uh, dia uh, dialogue and cooperation. Sorry for a, uh, a kind of a, a, an exemp uh, exemplary answer. Uh, thank you very much, Minister, uh, for your speech today. My name is Jung Yeobu from the ASEAN Institute from Seoul, Korea. Uh, recently, there was a summit uh, between President Park and President Xi. Though there is no uh, mention about Japan in their joint statement, but our national security advisor just before President Xi left Korea briefed to the press that the two leaders uh, exchanged their views and shared the concerns about the Japan's self, uh, collective self-defense. Uh, could you share uh, with us uh, what uh, Japan and your view about this? So, since it's a question from uh, Korea, uh, Prime Minister Abe has uh, many times said that, uh, including the uh, Second World War, uh, based on uh, uh, deep re regret for this, we will continue to walk a path of peace. So, f for those in uh, Korea, we I hope you will understand that uh, the Abe government has no different understanding than previous uh, Japanese governments as to uh, history questions. Dialogue and cooperation is important for all countries. And we hope that uh, China and uh, the Republic of Korea will uh, be able to have uh, uh, good relations. And we would love to. Uh, get uh, good opinions from the Republic of Korea, and we hope to have a good relationship with China as well. Um, both Chris Nelson and, and Kevin um, uh, talked about the, um, well, the jointness uh, and uh, interoperability that might uh, now be more possible with collective self-defense between U.S. and Japan among Japanese forces. Chris mentioned the complex situation in the first island chain, and you talked about how your um, members of the self-defense forces are every day um, dealing with uh, these, these uh, uh, challenges. Um, but um, the front line in many of these cases for Japan is the Coast Guard um, or uh, law enforcement. And I wonder if you could tell us something about how, uh, from the defense ministry's perspective, um, your strategy is evolving uh, and your cooperation is evolving with these other parts of the Japanese government that are not, that are Whitehall not gray hall ships that are under a different ministry. <laughs> Including the Senkaku Islands, it's the Jap J Japan Coast Guard, it's our maritime police, not the military that is uh, protecting Japanese territory. But. Uh, if uh, foreign uh, warships come in to sur have surveillance and patrol, then our uh, warships would uh, be engaged. But in principle, it is the Japan Coast Guard that is r responsible. But for the air, for any country, it's the Air Force that's responsible. In our case, it's the Air, air Self-Defense Forces. So you have to always have a calm approach, of course, but unfortunately, uh, since a year and a half ago, there have been uh, really unusual and uh, normally unthinkable approaches, and uh, they have uh, locked on with radar that's usually just used for attacks. And so even in those situations, at the uh, on the ground, and between governments, it's important to have communication and a hotline, and we want to make a system that will avoid uh, problems. At CSIS, I want to thank you. You're uh, Minister of Defense at one of the most interesting times uh, in Japan's post-war history, and I think everyone feels um, a lot more confident hearing your views um, and recognizing how much work you have, uh, and so we should let you get back to work. Um, uh, please join me in thanking Minister Onodera.